Uh, well, look, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, beh on behalf of Conway Hall, can I um, thank you all very much for coming here tonight. Um, tonight's uh, presentation has got many pleasures and one small problem which I want to help you overcome. The small problem is Serbo-Croatian, where the consonants are vowels and the vowels are consonants. So you look at this book and you say, this book is by Sroja. <laughs> and the, the, the perfectly natural thing for any audience, English audience to think, but actually it's Serja. <laughs> and so I all want you to say after me, greetings, Serja. Greetings, Serja. And you won't be disappointed uh, to see him. It's a <laughs> smashing book, this. It really is. I, I, I finished it last night. It's... Um, <laughs> it's uh, well, no, we were talking about before we came on, a number of times you've written a book. You go on the bloody BBC... And, and they say to people, oh, I haven't read your book. And then they start attacking you about your book. And, <laughs> and the best thing to do, I was saying to Sergio, this happens to you, say, but you said before you came on there that you hadn't read it. And uh, it's always flawsome. Awesome. Um, it's uh, a, um, a defence of, uh, an advocacy of, uh, non-violent revolution. A uh, quite brilliant uh, 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 account of it, backed up with evidence. And the evidence is not just... Um, from historical summaries. There's a very interesting part in it where Sergio talks about what revolutions succeed and what fails, and nonviolence, uh, surprisingly, often works more than it fails, certainly works more often than violence. But it's also a, a personal account, because um, Sergio, uh, so from, from organising a revolution in Serbia, not content with that, he's become a sort of travelling salesman of revolution around the world. Where, um, wherever there's trouble in the regime, sooner or later, when reading, reading this book, you get the impression that... Um, uh, uh, well, you don't get the impression. It's a fact <laughs> that state-run newspapers start talking about Ser Serbian agitators <laughs> infiltrating their country. And you might imagine you're sitting there in Burma or Syria or... Uh, Venezuela, you think, Serbian agitators. Yeah, I mean, the CIA and the KGB are one thing, but Serbian agitators. Uh, anyway, and, and in, in their own way, and it's a great compliment, so that's true, because there are. So, um, I've, public, publicists of both books, including uh, my book on censorship, have asked me to say, and I, and I have assured them, anyone here who knows me will, will know that I have no shame at all in doing this, I will plug both books relentlessly to the point of tedium throughout this show, and at the end of it, we'll be signing copies at the back of the hall. But without further ado, let's welcome the main event tonight, Sergio. Ooh. That was a fantastic introduction, and uh, though I'm forbidden to read your book, I will highly recommend everybody to buy it, because this is the book you don't read. Uh, first of all, super thrilled to be here in this historic place and within the very, very short time I've spent here that I've learned that this is the most radical place, the place where the you know, suffrage rights came out, the place which will hold discussion about the independence of India in the time of the struggle. And it's like there, I got so many information that I can't really process them. And this is where I'm going to start trying talking about the things, but the, you know, the, the technology always breaks on serves, so... I don't even have a clue. <laughs> How do we start? Okay, good. So, uh, welcome and many thanks for coming tonight. We had a long debate whether the, the, the full house is something we really earned, though that we are interesting people, or it is just this is this boring election campaign going on that nobody wants to see. And David Beckham is retired, so there is no good soccer on the TV. Whatever is the reason, welcome, and we will try to explain to you a little bit of our view on the world and a little bit about our books, uh, which are there for the people like you, people who want to do some kind of the social change. And uh, without further notice, I will start talking about what we talk in the book, but also talk about the, the story of my life and stuff like that. And there is a very good friend of mine, Marshall Gans, who teaches in Harvard, uh, art of public narrative. And he taught me that if you want to tell a good story, it must contain three pieces. The first one is the story of me. The second one is story of us. The third one is story of now. And I'll try by starting the story of me or the little me's. Well, unlike what my great host just said, this was me 25 years ago. So not a revolutionary, not an activist, not a politician, not the guy with a tie. It was the guy with a bass guitar. 
And that was because if you want to get dates in Belgrade back there in the 80s, you would need to do one of the three things. You should be very good at sports, and I'm well known for having two left legs and not being capable of hitting the ball at all. Or you could be very rich, which I was never, or you could play guitar in a rock band. Wow, that was the story for me. And starting there, before I was exposed to the Peter Gabriel's Biko, and because the, before the ugly guy called Milosevic came to power, I was really not into activism. And I thought the activism is for old nannies standing for dogs' rights and stuff like that, and not for cool guys playing in the rock bands. But then I was kind of disappointed because when the crazy nationalists came to power, the biggest island of the common sense was the urban and the educated and the rock. And this is where I kind of figure out, and one of the first stories we tell in the book is the story of the crazy rock band which was playing on a truck about the peace in Belgrade. It sounds very hippie to you guys, but you had that moment back there in the 70s, so it was reserved for right in the 90s. So here we were playing the, all we are saying is give peace a chance, while Milosevic was sending thanks to Croatia. And yes, we felt good about it, and yes, it was great feeling, and yes, it was the first touch of the activism, and it was absolutely inefficient because we understood that like the Occupy movement, which we're going to discuss a little bit later, we were preaching to those people who were already persuaded and that's not the way to bring numbers. We needed the rural people. We needed the rednecks, the people who really voted in this guy. So this is the book about the little me's and this is also the book about the second set of creatures, which you may know well, probably like 80% of you is now figuring out what the hell the talking has to do with the nonviolent revolutions. Well, this is the book about the hobbits. And what we figured out, aside of the fact that my parents were super liberal, they grow me as an atheist, so I pick a Tolkienism above other religions when I was a kid, uh, we came to figure out that the people we meet, the people we research, the people we are meeting out coming from 46 different countries, struggling for freedom, democracy, anti-corruption, are basically hobbits. And the nonviolent revolution is a job for hobbits. And why the hobbits? Because the hobbits are not really suitable for carrying out the big change. They are not tall or strong or clever or no magic. Basically, they are laid back. They like to drink, they like to eat, and they like smoking pot. So they're not really the most suitable persons in the world to carry out the revolutions. But like everywhere else, now what history teaches us is that it's actually the social movements, the best vehicle for the common people to bring about the social change. Well, guess what? Martin Luther King was not a Harvard graduate type of elite guy. He was a village priest. Lech Valenza, the guy who started Solidarity, was electrician, no college education at all. Not to mention Harvey Milk, the camera shop owner from San Francisco, or the bunch of guys who were more into rock in Serbia, or the bunch of engineers who started the Egyptian revolutions. So what connects these common revolutionaries and talking famous heroes with big hairy feet? is the fact that there was a day in life where they didn't really want to be the one to carry out the social change, but somehow they figure out that there is nobody else to do it aside of them, which is why we named one of the chapters in the book, it has to be you. That's the big difference. So we realize that there is nobody else to take the ring to Mordor, to oppose Milosevic. Opposition was miserably fail. The West was already rewarding us with a bunch of sanctions which helped Milosevic stay in power. And then you guys bombed us in 1999, which really encouraged him and boosted his ratings and almost killed my mom, which was in a TV building hit in the March 1999. So we figured it out that there is nobody else to do it but us. And guess what? We started a movement which was really big and nice and cool and we were branding things nicely and we were playing the cool factor and we were big at humor, not only because we grew up on Monty Python's Flying Circus and similar shows, but because we, the Serbs, consider ourselves to be really, really funny and really, really innovative. And please don't disappoint me. It's like, just trust that this is the case. Just keep me in this illusion. And it's like the, throughout the, the course of our work, we were meeting the same people, the brave people who started the revolution in Egypt, the brave people who were dying in Syria, 
opposing Assad, the brave people who were starting the revolution in small places like Maldives or distant places in Burma, and we figured out that there are rules which connect all of these common revolutionaries. You need to dream big but start small. You need to pick the battles you can win. You need to fight the battle in your head first. You need to understand that it is possible. So every time you meet a new group of activists, and I'm running a group which is called Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategies, and we work with people from 46 different countries. Every time you sit with these people, the first thing they will tell you, this will never happen here. Our regime is too oppressive or our people are too busy buying in Walmarts. Whatever is the reason, this will never happen here. So the first revolution which happens, happens in your little head. And then it comes to the creativity and humor. And, you know, people often say it's like, this sounds very naive, how you can dismantle the dictators with the humor. But wherever you look, you can really understand how humor becomes a powerful weapon. And we also kind of coined a little phenomenon we call laughtivism, which comes from laughter and the activism. And this is this genius of nonviolent movements to put the guy on the top between the rock and the hard place with a very simple action. I'll give you two examples. We're a group of 50 people. Serbs are not known of being very politically correct. So we came to this ingenious idea that if we paint the face of Mr. President on the petrol can, and there is a hole on the top, so like in the flipper, you put a coin in and you buy yourself a right to boom, hit the guy with a baseball bat. And we put it in the main street. And we just observe what is going to happen. Well, within the range of the 15 minutes, there were like the line of the people getting ready to hit the scumbag in the face. And it was loud and everybody was having fun. And we were having espressos and Marlboros in nearby coffee shop. But that was not the funny part. The funny part was when police arrived because they couldn't find their nose. You know, police follows the procedure. So they were reporting to their bosses, okay, we have a bunch of downtown shoppers hitting the barrel with Milosevic's face on it. What shall we do? It's like, arrest. There is nobody to be arrested. If they arrest downtown shoppers, what they will do with them? So they ended up arresting the barrel. <laughs> the picture of policemen dragging the barrel to the police car. I mean, imagine being a photojournalist at that day. He would call a editor and say, save me the cover page. I have the cover page for you. And wherever you look, it's a creativity of the people fighting the dictators. And the photo behind us is the one from a very little place called Barnaul in Siberia. It was called February 2012, and people were protesting Putin. And because somehow they caught him stuffing the ballot boxes in order to get 143% of the vote. He was not happy with 76, which we, he would normally get. And then, of course, the people couldn't protest, and they came out to this genius idea that if they build a little Lego town and bring their kids toys with the transparency, then they will have some fun and do the protest. It's a low-risk tactic, blah, blah, blah. And they've done it. And you can see on the YouTube, the first day, everybody was there. The people were taping. It went viral. Everybody has... Even the police officers were taping. They were having fun. There was no tension. Well... Tomorrow morning, when the thing reached 27,000 views on the YouTube, somebody in Kremlin got the alert. They called the police chief in Barnaul and said, this is not acceptable. If people see that they can get away with it, everybody's going to do it. So you need to stop this. Tomorrow afternoon, the press conference, the proud chief of the police, really square man with a hat, comes out and say, the protest of 100 legal men, 60 toy soldiers and 20 toy cars is banned <laughs> because toys are not citizens of Russia. <laughs> so now here we are with this shirtless posing president who spent so much time sitting on the top of his security apparatus having the most expensive PR machine, Russia Today, which is advertised even in your subway. I've seen the billboards today on the Baker Street. And, you know, he's very much into diving for amphoras and wrestling tigers and saving dolphins from drowning. <laughs> and he's afraid of toys. So this is what you get when you have a creativity faced with the authoritarians. But also, you know, the people in power, they tend to take themselves too seriously. Even when they are democratically elect, 
If you tease them, they will do something stupid. And you can always use this as a leverage point. Okay, here we come to story of us, which is basically the story of our ignorance. I will give you a little test. When you look at your history book, how much of this is war? The First World War, the glorious role of UK in the First World War. And then, of course, the battle for Britain in the Second World War. And then when you look at your DVD collection, there is a bunch of war movies. Even the stupid wars, like Vietnam, are super featured in your DVD collection. And now you look at the nonviolent struggle, and you understand that you've seen one good movie about Gandhi with Ben Kingsley, one or none about Martin Luther King, well, one super cool with Sean Penn about the Harvey Milk. How little we know about the thing that really changed our world. Because if we look at the figures, we will understand that Gandhi started the end of the colonialism and Martin Luther King made judging people per color of skin unacceptable in every corner of this planet. And then the Lech Walesa and other guns with mustaches really started the end of the Soviet Union and the United Europe as we know it. So I think it's our rule to learn more, even if that means reading the boring books like two of ours. Oh, I forgot Harvey Milk. <laughs> I forgot another hobbit, the guy who started the campaign. Do you remember what this campaign was? Was it about the gay rights? No. He was elected on campaigning, saying that he's the guy who will save San Francisco from the dog's poop. Never, ever underestimate the power of selecting the right battle. However your goal looks small, it may be the part of the bigger plot. And then, of course, the story of now. This is what we see wherever we turn the TV. There are thousands of people protesting. And somehow, if we are watching the BBC or CNN, we get the very wrong idea. And you had an encore, and he or she is really, really excited. It's like, oh, what a spontaneous surprising. Well, I have a bad news for you. There are like two types of nonviolent revolution. They're either spontaneous or successful. <laughs> Spontaneity will likely get you killed. And if you really want to look at the successful nonviolent movements, you will look at the unity and planning and nonviolent discipline. And movements who are capable to build this type of discipline are those who are capable to win. Well, it's not limited only to the authoritarian world. It seems that the hobbits and the political outsiders are coming to Europe. And we are witnessing more and more of this political nobodies growing in a very sclerotic scene of our mainstream political parties. UK is not an exception. You want to look at the Syriza, you want to look at Podemos, you want to look at the Beppe Grillo. For some reason, these anti-systemic parties are shaking the world. Whether they will be able to reshape it, it's a big question. And I don't have the answer on this question, neither my book answers this question, but I think we need to be ready for the new type of challenges. Because what unorderly revolutions can sometimes spawn are non-state actors, extremists ready to kill. How do we fight their narrative? How do we fight the tragic fact that when you speak with the kids from school in Jordan, they really think that ISIS is cool. How do you fight this cool factor? Can you mock them? Can you dry the swamp of the vacuum of narrative and delivery? Challenge for the next century, maybe. Well, at the end, what my group is committed to, we try to spread nonviolent skills. We don't try to tell people what to do. Well, Serbs always think that they know better, but we don't try to tell things what to do because we think the people who really are waging the struggles know the best. But I think we are witnessing the bad guys' learning curve. And when you look at the speed to which the autocrats are learning how to prevent this type of uprisings, and when you look at the level of censorship, which is the topic of your book, and the level of ways they find the legal ways, you know, it's like there are more NGOs closed in Russia because of the fire regulations than because of the political reasons. And you know, it's like the, the, one of the guys you mentioned, Chavez, quote, it's like, you know, so for my friends, everything. For my opponents, the law. It's a really interesting way on how you can selectively use this type of laws. And I think it's a learning curve. And uh, 
I think the speed to which we can learn the new tricks and teach positive trends and new tricks is the speed to which we can help this planet become the better place. At the end, wherever you are coming from, big or small, radical or moderate, left or right, don't forget one of the things this book will teach you. There is nobody else who can change the world for you. It has to be you. Thank you. Okay then, um, look, um, uh, I'm going to interview for about uh, half an hour and then uh, we can take questions from the audience, yeah? If, if that's fine with everyone. Um, you say you have people from 46 countries coming yeah. to your... Do you have anyone from Britain? None yet. None yet? No. Would you accept us if we Absolutely. can? Absolutely. You have With no, a great um, pleasure. You have no... Teaching British people how to use Monty Python in mocking their government will be my... I'm, I'm, I will do it for free. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm shocked we need to learn. Um, the, the, um, if I could just, just play out, because you were a bit modest in, in your introduction, and one of the, and because I didn't know a great deal about it, and I assume, uh, perhaps uh, falsely, that most people in the room didn't know about what happened in Serbia. Mm. Uh, to most British people, there was Tito mm -hmm. uh, in Yugoslavia, which perhaps in our naive way we thought wasn't so bad. It wasn't so bad at all. It wasn't so bad. Uh, and then suddenly there's Milosevic and Tuchman. Mm -hmm. and Who were this, very bad. And there's this new word, ethnic cleansing, we haven't heard before, and then there's wars. I mean, when you and... I don't say comrades. Is, is comrades one word? Would you describe your, your fellow revolutionaries as comrades? Well, oh, maybe. So, yes, we would. You would, yeah, yeah. Uh, take him on. This is a man who has ordered uh, or been complicit in. I don't know if they've approved the order. You know, something close to genocide in Srebrenica. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a man tied in with all kinds of absolutely thuggish. I, I, I don't think it's an aggravation. Let's call it fascistic nationalism with gangsterism. Absolutely. Uh, whole works. When you take him on. Uh, how do you take him on? How does nonviolence work against such a man? Well, I mean, it's like, first of all, to look back at the history, you need to understand that the, the guys with the bass guitars were born anywhere between 1969, maybe 1980. So that's the generation who was old enough to remember good old Tito's times. However, that's discutable, but for us, they mm -hmm. were good because we were, you know, internationally recognized, uh, lived a decent middle-class life, listened to the good music, have our own version of Clash and Bauhaus and Joy Division mm -hmm. and everything. And within this world, these nasty guys appeared, and they kind of simultaneously appeared in Serbia and Croatia and Bosnia. But we consider them more like a cultural shock than mm -hmm. like the really political thing, because immediately the whole identity was rebranded in terms that, you know, everybody hates Serbs, and we Serbs do hate Croats. Now, you are 18, and you are grown on a, going every summer to the Croatian coast. Mm. Immediately, somebody puts a an uniform and a gun in your hand and say, go there, kill this guy, because he's Croat. Mm. And that's a pretty schizophrenic situation for somebody who was grown in this, in this brotherhood and fraternity. And because Serbs are such a slow learners, we started with students' protest, and we really thought that we are going to do it the... Czechoslovakian way by mm -hmm. singing on squares yeah. and stuff like that. Well, he was more clever than that. And, and uh, while we were singing on squares, he would bring a BBC crew and, you know, show us as he would show a zoo and said, this is your Hyde Park. This is like the speaking corner. People can criticize me. Look at me. I have democracy. But rednecks are voting me in. So I'm sending mm -hmm. the tanks to Croatia. And then 96, 97, we caught him cheating with the elections. And he was becoming, as he was losing popular support, he was becoming increasingly autocratic. This is a kind of trend mm. where they rely less on popular support and more on fear. And that was not the unique trend for him, and we witnessed this in many different places. So our first uh, idea was we are going to do something on our little occupation level. And then the second idea was we are going to engage on the elections and win against him. But we were, understood that he's ready to steal. So in 97, we persuaded Milosevic to recognize local elections after three months of cutting our teeth on everyday protests, which was really thrilling, and all the citizens of Serbia went well. 
Uh, well, the opposition split after the three months. So we understood that if we don't unite the opposition, then they are going to become the part of the problem, not the part of the solution. Well, good luck with uniting opposition, then the good international community came with their stupid idea that the way to dismantle Milosevic was through bombing my mom, who was sitting in a TV building. And whoever thinks that it is a good idea, we should think about having 200 people in this room and we can disagree about almost everything, including the type of the shoes you love. But if we have the bear dancing in front of our door, which is the foreign military intervention, we'll be super fast in agreeing how to get rid yeah. of this bear. So George W. Bush ratings were highest at September the 12th. Milosevic ratings were highest during the NATO bombing. Plus, he killed the few opposition leaders and the journal. I mean, that was a state of emergency. Everything I thought was it was Clinton who did that. Hmm? I thought it was Clinton who bombed so. He did a lot of ethnic yeah. cleansing on the Kosovo at that time with an excuse that, you know, people are basically escaping the NATO bombs. Yeah. That was the state TV narrative. And that was, that was yet another excuse uh, for him to do the terrible things. Well, it's like uh, 1999 and 2000, we understood that we need to build from three different paths. One, Otpor was anti-Milosevic movement. Then we understood that he's going to steal around 300,000 votes. So we need to have the biggest turnout in the history of the country just to annul the fact that he is going to steal. And the population between 18 and 25 voted in 2000 with 72%. That's that never happened before. Mm. That will never happen again. Imagine 72% of young people voting in UK. That mm. would probably be close to the revolution. And, and, and then, if, of course, he stole the elections, and then we knew what we need to do. But it was the popular strike, the, the mass disobedience, closing of the biggest, uh, biggest uh, uh, coal mine. These were the tactics which were taking him out. Now, you, you, you talk about, very eloquently and very persuasively, about nonviolence. Mm -hmm. um, but it strikes me that suppose that nonviolence can only work in partially free states like the British Empire, like in India, mm -hmm. uh, like in the southern United States. Mm -hmm. Most terrible oppression, I mean, uh, disenfranchisement, colonialism. But the state isn't quite prepared to say, you stick your head above the parapet and we'll mm -hmm. shoot it off. And everyone knows that. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you accept that or do you say, um, or do you say, no, 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 these tactics I recommend to people Mm. They, these are the ones you, you should follow everywhere. Well, I mean, the part of this answer is science. And if you look at the scientific research, because we do teach on good schools, and we don't deserve that, but somehow people love dancing serfs, so they invite us to places like, mm. you know, like University of Essex or Harvard, and students do pay to listen to us. It's like scientific research says that 323 different campaigns in the last 100 years, uh, if you do the non-violent campaign, you're twice more likely to succeed. The rate of the violent campaign oh, success, no, 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 no. 26%, the I, rate of the non-violent campaign, 52%. I, I actually accept that. Uh -huh. uh, what I'm saying is... Conditions. Yeah, the worse regimes, mm. the worse the regime, mm -hmm. the harder it is for non-violent protests to succeed. It is... Because they just... Because yeah. if you know, the, you know, you do anything, the police come and arrest you, um, then... Mm -hmm. How do you there, is, there is always this big debate between the skills and the conditions, and the scientific people will say, you need that much level of democracy, that much influx of the opposition, that much foreign funding to dismantle the dictator. But, you know, there were struggles where we were really... I mean, for South, black South Africans, the Peter Boda government was a Nazi regime. You know, hmm. Killing a black person was yeah. no better than killing the dog. And still they found a way to bankrupt this regime. Yeah, but, it, you know, but how disgusting it was, mm -hmm. it wasn't a totalitarian state where anyone who stuck mm -hmm. there, who did anything, was um, arrested. I mean, for instance, I was very interested to read in here, uh, which I didn't know, uh, that there was a type of, not very big, I'm sure marginalised harass, but an opposition press in Belgrade when you were taking on Mm -hmm. Milosevic. So you could get publicity, mm -hmm. which strikes me as absolutely essential we for nonviolent process. But we developed it. It's like the, the one of the things you learn is that, especially working with the people from oppressive environment, is that the political and social space is never granted. It's up to you to conquer it. 
So it's like the, even in South Africa, you had the kids going from village to village yeah. and they were emulating the radio because they were singing the songs of freedom and telling the tales of freedom. In Serbia, you know, there were, there were the very famous graffiti saying there is no newspapers, there are walls. So it's like you develop a kind of the alternative media yourself because you know you will be censored. And I think relying too much, especially on the new media, it's a very bad, bad idea because this is the space which will be cut for you. So you're looking sorry, at... Sorry, the, I mean, could you just elaborate on that? Uh -huh. Because I was just about to say to you, um, well, you know, uh, civil rights movement. Um, actually, quite interestingly, I mean, I, I find it interesting because uh, being, being English is that... Uh, the civil rights movement, we have the most, we had the most terrible libel laws in this country, mm -hmm. um, which, part from campaigns in this hall, we got rid of. And America had them, had exactly the same libel laws as they, because they inherited mm -hmm. them when they had the American Revolution, they inherited the English common law. Mm -hmm. They still have a lot of English common law. And the libel laws were effectively abolished in America because of civil rights, mm -hmm. because what was happening was, Martin Luther King would organise a protest in Alabama. New York Times would write a really tough piece about the brutal police in Alabama. New York Times would then be sued mm -hmm. in, a, in Birmingham, Alabama, before a Confederate judge and an all-white jury for libel and have crippling damages. Mm -hmm. Damages that could put a paper out of business. So the American Supreme Court turned that up. Mm -hmm. But I was going to say, I was about, just about to say to you, I was going to say, well, you need some kind of free press, however small, mm -hmm. I and mean, even you still have it a bit, even in in, in Moscow. Uh, oh yes, yeah. like Echo Radio so, yeah. and stuff Otherwise, like that. Otherwise, your protests are taking part in the void. But I was about to say, but has the internet abolished that? Don't you need to worry about that anymore? Because you have the internet. Mm. Who cares if you have radical underground newspapers? It doesn't matter if the regime closes them down because the web can broadcast them. Well, it's like the. I agree with you, and I think the role of the civil rights movement in in making this anti-label laws. I, but we were just discussing this. I, I think it's really important and 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 a cool research thing. However, it's like the the one of the one of the things we discovered is the the more you suppress the political space, the less it's effective. Because like uh, you know you have you have a country like Iran, where obviously the regime controls the newspapers and stuff. Well, if you ask people, whom do they trust? They trust rumors. Hmm. It's like there is this very sexist way of saying things. It's in the 21st century. There are like three type, three type of ways to spread information. It's like uh, television, telecommunication, and tell a woman. <laughs> so, you know, it's like there are no newspapers, there are walls. It becomes a really powerful tool. So if you try to monopolize the political and social and media space, there will be alternative ways for people to leak. And guess what? They may be believing their neighbors more than they believe the national mm -hmm. TV. But in the terms of, of getting the free press, I think the, it is a really good idea. And I think it really relates to what you are talking about in your book, is if you have a nonviolent movement, it opens the opportunity to attack the multiple things, because it's already in the society. Mm. Um, this is a rather long question, because uh, I hope people in this room will, will read this book. Uh, uh, no, we'll make them read the book. We'll make, we'll make, we'll make them buy it. If they don't like we'll, it, we'll, we'll read you, it alive. We'll make you buy it, not, not necessarily read it. We have <laughs> our liberal principles. Um, uh, <laughs> we'll read it loud, like there, a radio there, book, there, there, and lock the door. There's one, it's not a criticism of you, it's one that's criticism of me. Um, I read this and I saw a political assumption mm -hmm. underneath it. That left to their own devices, left to their own free choice, People all over the world will believe in democracy, human rights, transparency, uh, religious and sexual tolerance, and racial tolerance. Now, I sort of believe that. I mean, the, the belief in universal human rights mm -hmm. rests on some assumptions is common to all people. But isn't there a problem for you and indeed uh, for me and maybe others in this audience that Actually, the tactics you use for... I mean, they're wonderful tactics described in this book and, and described, empirically based, described with evidence of how this has happened in country after country, mm -hmm. of disorientating, mocking, destabilising autocratic regimes and indeed democratic governments, mm -hmm. um, uh, could just as easily be used by... Um, uh, uh, 
uh, reactionary movements, Islamist movements, um, uh, movements that don't respect universal human rights. There's not, there's not really coming through this book a reason, an argument, a political argument for saying why you should, why, 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 why you should believe in this. Well, it was not even the intention to persuade the people to believe in this type of values, uh, aside of the fact that the nonviolent struggle becomes successful when you have numbers. And one of the things this book teaches you, and this is the dog's poop Harvey Milk story. Okay, you believe in the human rights, but people care more about the clean streets. So if you find a happy marriage between the values you stand for and the tactics you use to mobilize numbers and make the spectrum of allies, you will end up having numbers. Well, the trick is there. Yes, tactics can be used. I mean, Putin is super effective in using this type of propaganda. And ISIS is obviously very effective. And Marine Le Pen seems to be super effective in you know, pushing people against the immigrants and you know, building their, their numbers on this. But there is a certain extent to which you need a majority in the society to make a change. And it was not when Martin Luther King mobilized the black people. It was when the white people started joining. And it was not when Harvey Milk mobilized the LGBT people. It was when cool straight people started joining mm. this type of movement. And the numbers, and this is the, the basically strategy of the nonviolent struggle, these numbers are always in the mainstream. They're never on the fringe. So I mean, however these tactics may look seductive to the people, they will end up that by listening to the people and building this vision of tomorrow, which will build them to victory through numbers, they will need to get rid of their stupid fringe ideas, where these ideas are religiously extreme, right extreme, left extreme, because the numbers are always in the middle. So somehow, uh, aside of advocating, of course, these values, which we all stand for, I would say the very method of nonviolent struggle is more likely to achieve the results if you really listen to the people and I, if you really build towards the middle. Perhaps unsurprisingly, I found the most sort of heart-rending descriptions in this book were of Egypt and Syria. Um, but let's just, let's just tease that out a bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Egypt, you have uh, uh, people you, you, you helped advise, uh, that's, that's fair enough, uh, mm -hmm. uh, helped bring about the Surya Square Revolution. They get rid of Mubarak. Uh, the army, which is a very odd, hallowed place in Egyptian life, is still there, though, mm -hmm. still in control. There are free elections, and the Muslim Brotherhood win. Now, I mean, uh, I, 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 I despise the Muslim Brotherhood. But nevertheless, it... Uh, they were democratically elected. They, they were democratically elected. Uh, the army has enough. It throws them out, re-establishes, in effect, uh, a military dictatorship. Muslim liberals I know in Cairo, and perhaps people you know... They're all in jail now. Uh, well... Most of them. Well, some of them at the time were really quite conflicted. They were, mm -hmm. they were wondering, well... They were saying, well, don't make too big yes, a fuss about square, this. It's the movie. It's a cool you know, movie. Yeah, you don't make too big a fuss about this. Obviously, we don't approve of military taking over. Okay, suppose the Muslim Brotherhood were to start following the tactics in your book to overthrow the military once again. Mm -hmm. Would you say that by following those tactics, it would inevitably moderate, moderate them? Or I just wonder if the weapons used by the revolution can also be used by the counter-revolution. Well, it's like the Egypt is a very interesting story, very sad one, though, especially because the, I know the people, and people like Mohammed Adel, who are super cool people you would have coffee with, are now sitting in jail, and the people from military who are now sitting in power are not the people you would have coffee with. But, you know, it's like the, the basically the Egypt has uh, so many levels of problems, and one of the grand lessons learned there is... There is one thing if you fight against the individuals, and there is another thing you're fighting values. So if the value of the revolution was to establish a democratic Egypt, uh, that value would be there before Mubarak was down and before Morsi was elected. Mm -hmm. So the value would be so deeply embedded in the society that nobody would dare to dismantle democratically elected president, even the very incapable and unpopular one, which was Morsi. Definitely. So one of the reasons we are looking at a pretty successful transition in Serbia was, yes, Milosevic was, you know, the big goal was, and it's like this is how it looked about dismantling Milosevic, but it was not about him. 
It was about the set of things we really wanted. So when you have revolutions against, they are very likely to produce dismantling of a guy and toppling of the government. Where if you have a revolutions for values, they are more likely to be durable. I'll give you the example. Serbian revolution was about three things. Freedoms, like, you know, freedom of uh, assembly, freedom of speech, free and fair elections, free media. And then, of course, the peace with neighbors, because we got enough of these wars with Croats and Bosnians and ethnic cleansing and all this kind of crap. And then, of course, the, the road to European Union. And by winning, these values became a part of the society and they became something that the people are shareholders of. So what is mm. happening now is that the Serbian prime minister who was popularly elected with, uh, I think, 46% of the vote, predominantly, I mean, people couldn't get that victory in years. He was Milosevic's information minister. He's the most vocal pro-European Mm. protector of free and fair elections, Fine. and he's very peaceful with Croats. And Why? Because these values are something, you, you can't get elected in my country without these values. So if the struggle in Egypt was more focused around the values and less about the individuals, that was one side of mistake. Then second, proclaiming game over to early in the process. If you're playing video games, you know that you know, taking down this guy is one level, and then building the institution is another level. And having a stable democracy and two or three cycles of free and fair elections is the third level. These guys, they kicked out the Mubarak and just, you know, made a party and left the square. Of course, who took the victory? The two most organized groups in the society, mm -hmm. Muslim Brotherhood, namely, and the military. So these are the mistakes you don't want to do, but you need to embed them in the planning process. And this is why it is so important that you have the answer very early in the process. What do you want? Where do you see your country in 10 years? Not what you don't want. Hmm. There's, it's so easy to define what we are standing against, whereas what we are standing for is really deciding whether your movement is going to be an episode or you know, a season of Game of Thrones, or it is going to be the whole yeah. series. Sorry, I, I'll just try one more time with this. Absolutely. Do you ever think that people with whom you and virtually everyone in uh, Georgia, in Belarus, in Egypt, in uh, uh, repressed America in the 50s, uh, uh, all those people you quote, all those people fighting violence for human rights, people who are absolutely against them, like the Muslim Brotherhood, could use the tactics in your book to seize power. To, you know, in other words, or do you think that you know, we I mean, see it, the learning curve. Yeah, if you no, look no, at no, what, no, 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 yeah. no. I, I mean, I'm just trying to say that but why should the revolution, can't the revolution that, that you're advocating here, can't those tactics just be equally used by misogynists, by uh, theocrats, by... Yes, but if they want to win through the nonviolent struggle, still they will have the numbers that okay. they will find at the place where they need to get rid of their stupid ideology. So it's like, if they want to win through numbers, they will need to build from the middle. And this is where the Marine Le Pen should abandon her anti-immigrant policy to win the whole France. Otherwise, she will only get her voters' base very solid, but she will never get to where she want to be because she wants to shape France. Either like, it's like making the, using these tactics to mobilize her supporters. Yes, she can learn from these tactics. Whether she can be victorious, not very likely, because the very nature of nonviolent tactics includes the majority of the society, and these ideas are never, or they're very yeah, rarely. I like, mean, this isn't a criticism of mm. you at all, or, or, or of this book. It's just that, you know, when you were standing up there, you said you look at social movements in Europe, mm -hmm. and you said, uh, well, Greece and, uh, and yeah. Padamos in Spain. Whereas sitting here in Britain, we think of, well, actually, bloody hell, you know, uh, we've had the worst crash in capitalism since 1929, and what we've got, we've got UKIP, which is, you know, people always shout at you in Britain if you call it an extreme right-wing party. Well, I don't know what else you're meant to call it. Uh, but, you know, it certainly isn't moderate right-wing and is the insurgent party here in England, the National Front in France, mm -hmm. Marine Le Pen, and, you know, as well as just saying to them, well, look, you know, well, if Marine Le Pen really wants to win, she's got to, you know, move to the centre a bit. I mean, some of us just feel need to actually, the best way to stop a winning is to stop a winning by attacking them. 
and by uh, and by going at them. And it, it, it's just that it's just that sometimes uh, I do. Work. Do you ever think regimes learn from your they from do. your example? In I fact, mean, I'm absolutely. Put it another way. Absolutely. I think that's the that's the that's the very important question. I think regimes learn, and there is the whole book on it made by a colleague of yours, political editor in Slate magazine, Will Dobson, a good friend oh, of yeah. mine. He was researching into five vivid dictatorships and he found tremendous results. Like what Putin learned from 2004, 2015, A, how to prevent these movements from appearing, B, how to label every single idea of a protest as a foreign plot, C, how to develop as his you're own... Of, of course, yeah. of course, it's always us. It, it, it was Erdogan claiming that the Serbs are behind Gezi without us even seeing one single Turk. <laughs> it was really like, it becomes a kind of the narrative for these groups. Uh, it was, United Arab Emirates were put my organization on a terror list, so you can touch the real terrorist if you want. I will oh. give you the autograph later. I have my fake beard back in the backstage. And it's like they try to prevent you to get to these people because they are so damn afraid that they will learn mm. how to organize. And some of them are pretty effective. Look at the hybrid war that Putin is waging in, in Ukraine. He won the propaganda war. Mm. So because they are learning fast, it's our cause to help the good guys learning faster. Yeah, so sorry, this so, is the so, learning so, curve. So, so, and I agree with you. It's a million dollar question because I don't think the 21st century would be at all about who have more guns. I'm not looking at the prospect where UK would be more powerful than some other country because you can bomb it. Mm -hmm. I don't, especially after failing your parliament, which really made me happy about the idea of bombing Syria, which I liked very much. I think it will be more and more difficult for, you know, persuading people that a foreign military intervention is something we should get engaged. Well, how do we help these groups? Or how do we prevent Putin's and Assad's of this world getting in the position where they are undoubtable. And I think that's, that's the good thing. I think they learn. I think we learn. So I spent the last year trying to develop an online learning platform, which will A, enable people like you who are into fighting censorship to learn things through the free Coursera course and through the stupid videos. And when I say stupid, I say they're designed for the people who never think about the activism or the political movements, but they will be available in 15 different languages. So we really learn how to mock groups, how to build a basis, how to mobilize, how to organize. And then at the same time, you have the whole state machineries in places like Iran reading this stuff. Yeah, I was going to say. And they, oh, they're trying hard. Mm. And they have tremendous resources. So, I mean, mm. for us, it's probably looking how to make it more available in more languages, spread it free of charge, and use social media to get it available I, I, I to everybody. Mean, you, you, you were saying before we came on that whenever your, your name appears in print, um, I, I guess it's Russian, I don't know, but there are you know, paid trolls who, underneath Absolutely. every article, will say what? Your CIA course, or of course. Uh, of course. Mossad? Or, of course they learn. And it's like the... the but how do you deal with this is whether you're paying your own trolls, which would be playing their game, mm -hmm. or you're trying to find a way for their trolls to look ridiculous. So this is well, like... I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry to sound uh, 20th century fuddy-duddy and gatekeeper, which I don't think we should print them, but I mean, I think newspapers should print them. Plus, but, uh, I can't use the touch screen very well. Because okay. Uh, uh, I'm anyway, getting old for this. You mentioned as well... Um, uh, to turn from the very, I mean, it is a very, very difficult question. I mean, this is why I like to emphasize the battle of ideas as much, in that, in that, you know, I don't see why the Muslim Brotherhood, who have great, you know, they won an election, they're oppressing, why they can't use your tactics. But I think, they if you, can. but if you want to fight the Muslim Brotherhood, you have to fight their ideas. Sim similarly with, with Putin. But let's move on. You did mention here, and this is something that's bothered me quite a lot, in that uh, I have been writing for years uh, about things that are coming up now in the British election uh -huh. campaign, like if you're a foreign billionaire uh, who, uh, you know, whose life, you know, uh, uh, proved Balzac's maxim that behind every fortune lies a great crime, you could come to London, you could live in London, be protected by libel laws and you wouldn't have to pay the taxes you have mm. to pay. 
And that's finally today, I said our election campaign was born, become an election issue in Britain, which is a great thing to see. But you, you have the collapse of our financial system. You have in, in Britain and America the Occupy movements, mm -hmm. which, unlike Syriza in Greece or Podemos in Spain, have not really crystallised anything. And I was very interested, you were really quite critical of them in your book. Could you yes. perhaps explain why? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I, I was meeting these guys at the peak of their power. There is this uh, great left-wing guy professor called Todd Gitlin, who yeah, wrote a book, yeah. Todd is great. So Todd is a great friend, and he brought me to Colombia. And he says, you want to meet some people. They have great ideas. They have great... This is the, the new era of American activism. And, I mean, they can learn a lot from you. So I met them. There were 20 of them. Super bright, super clever, probably more educated than both of us, which was like... Not the typical hobbits, like a little bit upscale mm -hmm. people in terms of... Gandalf. Gun well, more like leaning, yes. Gandalf leaning type of guys. Yes. And they were really, really bright. And they have exceptional understanding of the crisis that America is going through. And then they say, okay, it's like, what do you want? And they come with the greedy banks and 99 against one. It's like, no, no, no. I know what you don't want, what you're wanting. Here we come to the... Sololinsky theory of successful movements, because in the Rules for Radicals, he says, anger will only bring you that far, hmm. but anger without hope hmm. is a recipe for disaster. So one thing that they did not done well, and then I will go to Podemos, because they're a very interesting case of a movement growing into political party, because hmm. they avoided some mistakes that the Occupy and others have made in the past. Uh, Failing to understand the, the, why do they need a sound strategy. Uh, branding the movement completely wrong, in my point of view. If you are following only one tactics, what, how the hell they will attract people like you and me? I mean, you need to write for your newspaper. I have an eight-month-year-old son, and I need to teach. I really stand for your goal, but I can't spend the whole day occupying the place. There are like 200 different tactics. A, B, you want to become unpredictable. If you're only occupying one thing, your opponents will know where to find you tomorrow, and day after tomorrow, and day after tomorrow, and you know, they can continue the business as usual. Uh, C, I think uh, if they only branded this movement 99%, it will be far more appealing to the people around the world. And one of the things they did particularly wrong, in my point of view, they had this very anarchic idea of we are not going to be organized. Sorry my English, but if you have 10,000 people, you need an organization to manage 10,000 people. Mm. Vertical, horizontal, centralized, decentralized, it's up to you to decide. But there must be a decision-making process and there must be decision-executing process. Mm. Otherwise, the people will leave. People love things which, you know, they feel the part of the group and the part of the organized group. When you... Fast forward these mistakes, which is why I'm very hopeful about basically social equality movements, and you go to Podemos. They were capable to build up the vision of tomorrow around the very, very tangible goals. Unemployment, forced eviction, kind of social equality. They were capable to build outside of the liberal left base. Mm. They talked to the common people. Mm. They used the media of the political parties that they try to dismantle instead of just sticking to the Facebook, which my mother can't use. She's 76. Yeah, 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 yeah. They are using the TV and the radio and leaflets and posters. Most important for me, and this comes as, as an experience of the Serbian movement, the reason why Serbian movement was so successful was the concept which we was calling the resistance from your neighborhood. Podemos are super decentralized. They're real grassroots. Mm. Every street, every square, and it is coming from indignados. Their movement was not, let's get all together on one square and occupy it. It was the little assemblies in every neighborhood. So wherever you look in Spain, there is a cell. Mm. So now, because you have this grassroots organization, A, you can listen to more people. B, you can talk to more people and mobilize them to really do stuff over the elections. So for me, I don't really see this as a done recipe, but learning on your mistakes is something that this movement should do. What, what and I think it's like the, the, when you look at the Occupy and you look at the Podemos, they are kind of a evolved 
Occupy movement, mm -hmm. and I think uh, if you're looking at the, at the, how this anti-systemic or in, in this case social equality movement can become mainstream, you will look at the recipe where they learn from their mistake, they organize their organizational failures, but first of all, they know what they stand for. Mm. I mean, an American friend of mine, very left-wing American friend of mine, uh, it, it sort of shocked me, but uh, I got it quite right in my view. And by far the most damning comment of Occupy, and it applies, Absolutely. Uh, apply, applies to Dutch Britain here, was, was uh, actually by far more successful grassroots movement was the Tea Party. Absolutely. Because it develops I'm, a program. I don't know from, what. From, I, our, I, from, our, from our idealistic I'm, point I'm, of I'm, view, so we are, this yeah, is a I'm, pity. I, 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 I did, right. I, beyond saying banks are dreadful, banks are not, okay, what are you going to do? If, what are you going to do? What laws you want to pass, what the programs you want to do, you know, it's um, and there, in Anglo-Saxon societies anyway, there is a certain resistance against just getting behind change and organising for which, as you say, does require some kind of but vertical like, hierarchy. Even, even it like, requires some kind of hierarchy because your absolutely. opponents are going to be very hierarchically organised. But also, targeting is very important, and this is the point where I want to, to rely on what you say. It is the rednecks in Iowa and the farmers in Wales you want to persuade when it comes, for example, to climate change. Mm. Which is, I had this endless debate with the cool people who organize about the climate change, and every time I have a stupid question, how many of you have ever seen the polar bear outside of the captivity? Like, no one? <laughs> and how many of you have seen the burnt corn and, you know, the cattle is dying, mm. and the effects of drought. Okay. You want to talk to rednecks in Iowa? Talk their language. Forget about the public awareness rising around the polar bear and say, we need to stop climate changes because you're losing money. Yeah. Now you're talking their language. Of course. And if you can come out with the figures, you're maybe recruiting the very base of your opponent, which is the recipe of your success in on one struggle, for something very abstract for them, like the climate change was. Now, this is not the climate change, this is drought. Drought is killing your corn, corn is feeding your family. What can we do to stop this drought? But this is a little evolution in which you stop talking to your own voters base and step out of your own ideas and your little comfort yeah. zone and go to talk to the people who don't think like you. And stop, well, whether the audience here are people who think like you, ah. we are about to find out because I think uh, I can see microphones at the ready. Do we have yeah. microphones? Uh, if anyone would like to answer questions, I'll try and do it properly. Uh, right, uh, there's a lady there, just because there's a microphone near you. Oh, and could we have questions, please, not speeches? <laughs> Ser I'm serious about that. There are, there are armed guards. Forget all this li liberal nonsense. Non-violent guards. They will throw you on the street and they will be very violent. They will violent. giggle you. Questions. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for the speech and the discussion. It was brilliant. Um, I have two questions. First, uh, can your blueprint for revolution work in Russia, in a country that's so great, I mean, it's much larger than any other country in the world, and where a state of propaganda is pretty much genius? Uh, my other question is, at the moment, I'm not sure if you know, but there's an Occupy movement in London universities, and I was wondering if you're busy tomorrow and would like to come and talk for LSE <laughs> Occupy movement, and maybe teach us uh, <laughs> how to do it right? Um, thank you very much. Uh, I gladly accept the invitation. I will be in, in Bristol tomorrow on a festival of ideas, coming back to London Friday. Uh, I'm here till Saturday morning, but I will leave you my card, and we are coming to the Revolution 2.0, and if you guys have internet, we can organize an online class, and we can talk about you know, strategy and tactics next week, and I would be super glad to do that. I didn't know about this movement, so it really opened my eyes. Uh, Russia, however, it's a, it's a very interesting battlefield, not only because the Putin is becoming the master of it, not only because he's so skilled in propaganda, but because we don't see the people who are effective there. And I think the challenging the autocrats is becoming more a battlefield choice than the ideology choice. And I think if you really want to become effective, you want to pick the battles you can win. And in the cases of, of autocrats, it's far often less sexy topics. So it's not the human rights and democracy because it's very difficult to mobilize the people. And I'll give you the examples. Like the, when you read the dictator's learning curve, you'll understand that there are two groups who are particularly very effective in challenging Putin's government. None of them was dealing with human rights and democracy. Kim Ki Forrest, it's a, it's a young woman who started building a petition and a case 
around challenging the government, who was, of course, corruptedly building the highway through the kind of the state reserve and stuff like that. And she gave a lot of stuff. So it was anti-corruption slash environment thing, which was cost putting a lot of money and a lot of work and make her even elected in a local parliament because she became a kind of a super popular. Another one which you're going to like is we often advise movement to forget about the politics and to go and listen to the common people. Very often in autocracies, one of the problems is that they don't deliver. They don't deliver public transportation, public services, pensions, economy, but more often they don't deliver more tangible things. So in, in Yekaterinburg, which is the third biggest Russian town, they don't fix streets. So the streets were the full of the potholes. And of course the people were not coming into the city hall and protesting and occupying the city hall because they will be arrested, beaten, tear gassed whatsoever. And, uh, or labeled the terrorist criminals, or they will even find a Serb who was training them, probably, on the TV. It's always a, it's always a hobbit. But basically, the point what they've done, they were going after these potholes, and they painted like their own version of Boris, the mayor, around the pothole, and then, you know, whoever is the governor. And so now we're having these guys whose mouth were basically the potholes. <laughs> so what you do when you hit a pothole is you curse. If you ever draw a car, if you ever hit a pothole, it's a natural, however polite the British you can be, you curse. And especially if you're a Serb, you curse loud. And what they were dealing with was really spreading a message and they were connecting. You know, in the minds of these people, public officials are not accountable. So bringing the very idea that I'm paying you to fix my potholes, this is where your salary is coming, this is from my pocket, from my tax, was a kind of revelation. The funniest thing was the first reaction of the local government was not to fix the potholes, but to repaint the faces. <laughs> so yes, the resistance is possible, but talking about the, the bread and butter issues, we call them bread and butter issues, they're not necessarily tied to bread and butter, but talking about the issues like potholes will, will probably give you more appeal to the wars because potholes equally appeal to left, right, old, young, liberal, more democratic, less, because they all drive cars. Okay. A uh, question over there. Yeah. Sorry, I, I will get to everyone if I can. First of all, Hvala vam puno i drago mi je. Hvala tebi. I, I was curious, you mentioned, it's a bit of an abstract question, but you mentioned during the talk that to, to really gain momentum, a movement needs to reach the mainstream mm. populace and, and, and sort of reach them with issues that they care about. Um, and then you also mentioned, on the other hand, that movements need to whittle down and refocus. And it, for example, the Mary Le Pen thing where um, perhaps she needs to drop some ideas to get where she wants to go in that, in that idea. So do you think it's better or more effective to come with a broad approach and whittle down as you go to reach more people or to gain support at the beginning and then refocus and radicalize in some ways to make effect? It's a good question. The answer it, it depends on what your struggle is about. If it's about something really small and something really tangible, then it's probably very clever to focus your resources on the tactics which will bring you there. And if it's more broad thing, you should look at the broader picture and then start by the doable pothole type of tactics, which will bring you attention and authority and stuff like that. And you can always imagine it as a stairs. And you know, there is a little thing you do, you pick the battle you can win, you gain more support, you proclaim the victory, you get the hell out of there. And then you appear again with a little bit more people, with a little bit more funds, with a little bit more courage. You do three potholes or you do 15 towns and you know, you appear and you get the hell out of there. And it's like getting the hell out of there, it's not a joke. It's what made Tiananmen protest a disaster. Because you know, during the research of the book, I met a guy who was a very prominent member of the student, student Politburo, however it was called in Tiananmen. And he claimed that five out of ten generals of Chinese army were ready to deflect. So they were this close to the popular change, and then the government offered a deal. And instead of taking the partial deal, proclaiming the victory, and getting the hell out of the Tiananmen, they were going for a zero-sum game. And of course, the government was not in the mode of canceling themselves. And next thing you know, the tanks came from Manjuria, the people were slaughtered. And since I had this coffee, which was one of the lousiest coffee I had in my lifetime, in a little coffee shop in New York, Americans and coffee, that doesn't go together. 
uh, well, I'm a European. And that's like, since I had that coffee, I'm always thinking how the China would look now if they were in the mode of looking at the stairs, saying, mm -hmm. okay, we'll take this, you know, resignation of this minister, a little change here, the more freedom for organizing, proclaim the victory, go home, and next time we see each other at the university of the success. Mm. So it would probably be the completely different game. I can't tell which. So this is really thing you want to think about. You're at the victorious point, and you have this challenge to continue, to occupy again, to build a little bit more, to go for a little bit more, but how this fits your strategy. The problem with, with the planning phase, like you imagine the mountain and a strategic guy sitting on the mountain, and then you imagine a little river. This is how I explain it to the people. The guy who are on the boat in the river, they just see the next curve and the next curve and the next curve. And being inside this tactic is so seductive. There, is, there are several more addictive things than outrunning the police while the tear gas have this beautiful adrenaline smell straight here. It's like, you see, I love it. Mm. Yeah, it's powerful. <laughs> and, but, you know, there must be a guy sitting on the mountain saying you, stop, you rest there, next curve is left, next curve is right, because from the boat, you don't see it. So having this type of people is really important in the movement, and yes, it doesn't sound very sexy, but you need them. Uh, uh, right. Uh, uh, gen uh, gentleman there on the end of the row. Yes, fabulous talk. Thanks very much. You pointed out that the Western uh, bombing of uh, Serbia was, uh, from your point of view, horrendous, and uh, you've advocated that the Western governments shouldn't be doing such military interventions. What would uh, you like uh, Western governments to do in, to try and help uh, the various parts of the world, whether it's uh, Syria or uh, mm. uh, uh, Libya uh, mm. or Iraq, how would you want them to intervene? Is it just a matter of uh, sanctions or are there more positive actions that can be mm. taken? Well, I will leave the one part of answer to you because maybe you would be in a mode talking about the censorship and providing these people with a, with a kind of more information. I can tell you from my own example, we had all kinds of international consultants, democracy promotion agencies and stuff working in Serbia. And they've done some tremendous work, like supporting free radio stations with equipment was super useful because it enabled us to spread the information against the state propaganda. And that was not really an expensive thing. And then one of the things which we do is we think that you know, giving people skills, it's very important, like teaching people how to fish, teaching people how to deal with propaganda, teaching people how to mobilize, organize, teaching people how to protect their people in jail. And then there are also other things, you can stand for values. And, uh, you know, there was a beautiful part of the Commonwealth, uh, which you probably know from, uh, from uh, movie stars' uh, honeymoons, which is called Maldives. So in 2008, the Maldives had their first elections and their government was changed. And there was a super cool guy whom I tend to know personally, Mohammed Nashidani, who came as their democratically elected president. And of course, because the change was fast and because it's a very conservative island slash Muslim society, there are a lot of people who are not happy with change. Well, Mohammed Nashidani is now in jail, accused for terrorism. Now you can look at the Maldives from the point of colonial superpower and try to smack them with sanctions. That will be typical colonial slash imperialistic approach. Uh, where you can look at the lonely planet and list the resources which are funding the oppressive government and put them on the ban list and stop going there and start persuading your celebrities that by going there, they're funding the oppression. Now we are talking about the very smart way of dealing with stuff. You're supporting a human rights there, but you're not into direct Intervention. Of course, military intervention is out of order. It's also, we can talk about the sanctions. And if you look at the real pillars of the support of Milosevic's government or Putin government, you'll find that it is not basically too much of the ordinary people. It's people with money, people with connections. Well, these people love to have condo in London or their kids love to go to school here in the UK. So targeting the people, but the very limit, like we call the sniper sanctions, they work. Shotgun sanctions, like you're making a trade embargo on Iran 
or you made a trade bargain in Serbia, that only destroys middle class. Would you, what, if I had a Kosovo Muslim on the yeah. stage uh, who uh, was being mm. slaughtered by Milosevic uh -huh. in 1999, what would he say? Would he say, well, actually, NATO shouldn't have intervened? Uh, what are you going to say to those families? Because you know the fact of the matter is, you know, not the, the Serb army. It was the Serb army actually. The um, uh, and militias mm -hmm. were coming into Kosovo, and they're either going to be stopped or they weren't. Um, mm. Or do you just let that play out? I, mean, I, I accept it's not an easy question. Well, I mean, it's like the if I look at the Kosovo, I would I would look at the phase of the struggle, which was very iconic and nonviolent. So, if I would be you and wanting to help Kosovars, I wouldn't wait for a military guerrilla okay. to start in Kosovo. I would go to Ibrahim Rugova, who was a Kosovar Gandhi, hmm. before the guerrilla came in. So, I would really support nonviolent struggle in Kosovo rather than arming and supporting KLA. One thing I so find it's like the general yeah. idea is like, you know, what do you want? Because if you support KLA, what you get is you'll get mobsters in power. At the end, you are going to bring these people up. Mm -hmm. So we'll end up, you know, Kosovo is leaving Kosovo in bulks for European Union now because they think they are run by thugs. Oh, yeah. it's, like the, it's like it is what you want to achieve. One thing I find interesting about bringing this up to now is you're going back to your trolls. Mm. Um, trolls I love. Especially you've, for breakfast. You, you've got as, as um, uh, I can't think of a better way of putting it, serious news that covers the world as that declines because newspapers, news organisations, mm -hmm. business model has been blown apart. We haven't got the money. It's very interesting watching a British and American government. You've got uh, Russia today of pumping course. out propaganda all over the world. You've got Fox News pumping out. Again, mm -hmm. you can't trust it. Uh, you've got Al Jazeera, which is uh, a Gulf monarchy finance mm -hmm. station. You, you try making an argument in Britain now. No, no, no. The World Service is very important. Mm -hmm. BBC World Service, just not, not, not doing anything as grand as supporting non-violent resistance, as just providing mm. accurate news in language. And, you know, it's the idea that anyone in British politics would consider funding it again. They slash its funding for it the BBC doesn't really care for it. You know, Western governments, we go on and on about Western propaganda, but actually Western governments don't seem to think that it's important to just say, we will fund things that existed in the Cold War, like the BBC World Service, mm -hmm. you know, for instance. Or Free Europe. Or Free which Europe, Which was important. Yeah. That was yeah. the only media outlet which worked during the bombing in Serbia. Yeah. The you know, only source of news you can rely on. And in some sense, they, they, um, uh, they leave it all. They let things rot and crises is prices build up and build up until suddenly you are talking about planes threatening your mother. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's sort of, it's mm -hmm. sort of they don't, they don't mm -hmm. think ahead and think earlier, whereas, you know, Putin in Europe is playing a highly sophisticated information war. Absolutely. And, and, you know, Russian uh, civil servants, Russian generals will talk off the information war and have mm -hmm. an information war strategy. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. And I, I read a really good piece, I think it was in, in Economist, few weeks ago what the Europe should do and they were discussing two different models like one is funding the Cold War information uh, propaganda or whatever accurate truth machinery another one is what European Commission now tries to develop a kind of a entity which will it is called the uh, Mythbusters which yeah. will go after this myth and do kind of stuff I love the name yeah. though I'm not thinking that it will be particularly effective if it's something done by Brisser bureaucrats. So I don't have too yeah. much confidence in their efficiency, but that's my personal point of view. I think uh, helping the success story of Ukraine is the answer to your question. If you can help Ukraine to become less corrupted, more democratic with the people who want to live there and who can live their decent lives yeah. and share liberal values, there is no propaganda which can dismantle the fact that the people are there living. If, however, you leave it becoming another failed story in the terms, you know, the, whether it is challenged from Russians or not, but looking at the reforms, so they need money to pursue these reforms, you can fund these reforms, where you want to establish the place which is economically independent and capable of propaganda slash media defending itself in the five years. 
It's yeah. where, you, where I would look at the long okay. term. Like, you want to look at the problem, because then in five years, if Russia today said, you know, these guys are fascists, you'll just laugh out loud. Yeah. And no, they elected the fifth government in a row in democratic elections. It's like, free who, you know, BBC can say tomorrow they want, but it's like, you know, whatever, Guardian can say, okay, the Serbia is not a democratic country. Well, you, but you may come here and understand that we changed five or six different governments in the mm. free and fair elections, which is a verifiable fact. Mm. So if you were success story, institutions, democracy, this is what we are looking at. And then I think the propaganda stays up in the air because every propaganda needs to rely on some facts to be effective. Okay, now, uh, we're running short of time, so what I want, and it's now going to be more like a game can show, collect it, can for, collect you, for you as much as anyone else, we're going to have quick questions and quick answers, yep. and you're going to have a maximum of a minute. Uh, yep. So, uh, I, I, I see, man, but uh, who's... Close, the, the, the chap there. Oh, no, no, you go to the lady there. The, the, the lady there. <laughs> that way, that way, that way. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about a parallel movement in Serbia during the 1990s, uh, Women in Black. Could you say something about the way they approached the same issue and did you work together and how you feel about their tactics as compared to yours? Uh, very important, trying to be the consciousness of the society, very brave in standing against the war, very brave in taking tough punches from nationalists, uh, some of the bravest women I met in my life. A great idea, uh, very extreme in terms of incapability to grow or getting ready to affiliate with other groups. And I think the lack of the coalition potential was their problem. They were standing for a super cool goal, and basically the Otpor was using the same physical space as they did, which was the safe house called the Creative Center, something like this, at the beginning. So we know them very well, and we appreciate them very well. And I still think they, they still stand for the same goal, which I really like. And I don't think they expired, because the reconciliation reminder is constantly needed in the situations where we had a civil war and ethnic cleansing. Okay, there were some people down here. Yeah, just, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Already, just, here's what we've already made. <coughs> All right, I'll be as quick as I can. Um, NATO jets nearly killed your mother, as you No, mentioned. they didn't kill her. Okay, no, sorry, nearly up. did. Sanctions bolstered the nationalists. Now, we've got very similar situations. We've got uh, the British government has just sent military advisors to the Ukraine and seem to be bolstering uh, the, you know, the, uh, the Ukrainian opposition now government. We've had humanitarian intervention in Libya, which has destroyed Gaddafi and actually led, left the country now to warring factions and jihadists. So a really important question. The liberal left cheered on the NATO strikes in Serbia, attacking the equivalent of the BBC mm -hmm. and nearly killed your mother, and bolstered the nationalists. Is the liberal left, the people with good instincts, actively supported that? So what's, what should we do when we're asked... In the, in the case of humanitarian intervention, what should we do in response? Libya, Ukraine, Serbia, <laughs> happens again and again. What should, but, what's your advice? Let's stick to Ukraine, it's happening now. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of military advisors, which are discutable, I would send uh, 50 people who will draft the best laws on anti-corruption, uh, five Oxford professors who will deal with the constitution, and you know, you can take the very long line. Skills, 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 knowledge, 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 experience, and probably pre banks which will start microcrediting the local businesses which can survive. So I'm not advising this, but it's like I had a very many ideas how to bolster the local capability to build up the sustainable democracy and sustainable economy. But the problem with this is that, you know, sanctions are easy. We vote the sanction in the parliament, we get the political points, we get pu published in Guardian. And who the hell remembers? You know, it was your prime minister, the guy I quote very often, Winston Churchill, who says, however the strategy may look good, you need to occasionally look at the results. <laughs> but right. so slow and steady, building rather than, you know. W what use is an Oxford professor against the Russian <laughs> army in eastern Ukraine? Uh, Oxford professor can do much uh, against the Russian army in eastern Ukraine. Oxford professor can do much in training Ukrainians how to deal with their own corruption and build a success case. Uh, next question. Uh, we'll go to this side, ladies and gentlemen. We're doing one side at a time. 
Hi, um, my question is about the building of the coalition against the di dictator. Does, doesn't the quality of the coalition determine the success of the result? So if you go into coalition with people who are, who are, too, who are criminals or um, part of the military, um, doesn't that later set you up for failure, similar to what happened to the prime minister who got shot in Serbia? Mm. He got shot by somebody who was part of the, part of the um, toppling of, of the dictator like in, in the end. So uh, isn't it better to wait for more quality, uh, uh, like a better coalition, than to rush into toppling and then take the risk that the results might not end up uh, as, as you'd want them? So, same thing in Egypt. Uh, that's an interesting question, especially because uh, uh, I knew the guy you were talking about, uh, Zoran Djindic, was the, one of the best people we ever had and was a kind of my political father. It was his uh, widow sitting with my mother on my and Masha's wedding. And that was the great loss for Serbia. Uh, if you ask me what I would do if I was him, and whether I would go negotiate with the police if I can save people's life at the October the 5th, even if that means I will expose myself to the possibility of being killed, I would probably say no, but then I'm I'm bigger coward than he ever was, and I was less committed, and I was worse man than, than he ever was. So he did what was necessary to preserve the lives. Uh, do I think that the cleaning of the security apparatus was something we should do far faster, and that will probably save his life? Yes, but that was the reform process. So. Yes, uh, he was not in a coalition with the police force. He was in a coalition with more or less democratic opposition. And yes, we needed to negotiate with the people who, who can shoot the people in order to prevent lives from saving. Uh, should we dismantle these people early on in a transition process? Yes, we should. And I think that was the mistake which cost his life. Right, we've got one time for one more question. Who has got the best question? Gentlemen there. Um, this is quite a personal question. I don't expect you to answer the question on stage. You and you have a. <laughs> it's okay. We can, good... we can wrap the meeting <laughs> but, up now, ladies and gentlemen. But, <laughs> you've alluded to it in your early the answer you've just given. Did you ever really fear for your life? Which I expect the answer is yes. It's almost rhetorical. And the second part of that is how did you actually deal with that? state of mind, because if you're going to be a revolutionary, there are people that are going to want to take you out. So, thank you. <clears throat> well, this is not a personal question. This is a very important question. Yes, I did fear for my life. And especially during NATO bombing, it was bizarre, because the opposition people were disappearing. There was a state of emergency, martial law, so people, I mean, the editor of the big Serbian newspaper, who told me escape Serbia, was assassinated. So, I could be you know, among the next. And uh, one of the ways to deal with it is understand fear. And I think one of the great things we do, and uh, there is a 35-page little booklet for dummies, which you can download for our website. It's called Making Oppression Backfire. It tells a compelling story how understanding fear, but fighting its detrimental effects, is really effective. I'll give you the situation, which may sound crazy to you. I was arrested. December 19, 1999, uh, beaten a hell out of me, brought to the police station, and then the police person took the gun out and put it in my mouth. And all I had to tell him was, uh, you know, I'm not afraid, you're not going to kill me here. That was not being brave. That was knowing what's there. There was not one single person who was shoot down in the police station in the blonde day with a thousand people in front of the police station. So learning about the oppression, preparing people from the oppression, and taking oppression as a part of the job is not making you braver, but it makes you dealing with the detrimental effects of fear easier. I have to say what I found one of the best sections of this book, and I'm winding the conversation back to books, uh, <laughs> is Certainly, just describing how, in the early days of the anti Milosevic movement, people who had been to prison would come out, been police station, and give a briefing to all the mm. pro democracy processes. This is what happens. You get arrested. They take you into here. This is what the room looks like. This is what they say to you. Here are your answers to the questions. There wasn't people who weren't frightened about going to prison or the police calling them off, but 
there's no greater fear than fear of the unknown. At least if you recognise it when you come across it, it's slightly, it's slightly less frightening. Now, I promised Sergius Publisher that I would give uh, his book a massive plug on sale back and uh, my book as well. Uh, just mentioning that. Um, uh, and while you all you know, start uh, reaching for your purses and wallets or perhaps phoning your bank manager or checking your <laughs> internet bank account to see how many thousands of pounds you can raise multiple copies, could you please put your hands together and thank Sergio for a fascinating talk tonight. Really good. That was really, really good. That was really good.